So as you may have just heard, uh, the, the, the theme of the fall semester at Ratio Christi is going to be going through the Old Testament, all those questions that you've always been wanting to ask but never got the opportunity. And uh, I was asked to kind of give us a, a bit of a kickoff, get us thinking about the Old Testament, what are those big questions, and, and how do we really make the Old Testament make sense with the Christian faith. And whether you're a believer or not, I think you'll find this topic to be really rewarding and really fascinating. So I want you to quickly in your mind, if you just think, we're out of church, right? So if you just go ask any random churchgoer, what's Christianity all about? I wouldn't ask you to necessarily come up with like a, a single sentence, but at least think of some of the words. What are some of the words that are going to come out of their mouth? It's going to be some pretty Sunday schooly words, right? Jesus, the Bible, salvation, sin, right? Most of it's going to be focused on this idea that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sin, and now we're a part of this this body called the church, and when you die, you'll go to heaven rather than hell, right? This is the kind of thing you're liable to hear. Now, here's the problem. If I then say, interesting, Bible, right? Okay, I'm going to open up my Bible, and I'm going to go through the Old Testament. That's the majority of the Bible, right? And I start going through the Old Testament, and I start making a word list of the themes that seem to dominate the Old Testament. They're not exactly the same. There's a lot about the the history of the nation of Israel. There's a lot about the law called the Torah, There's a lot about the exile and the temple, priesthood, kingdom, these kind of words. And it doesn't make any sense that the Old Testament focuses on one list of words when you just finished telling me that our faith is about the other set of words. This is weird, right? For those of you who grew up in the church, you may have not recognized the weirdness. But for someone coming new to the faith, the fact that these two lists are that different and have that little overlap is strange. It's really strange. And if if we go to the New Testament, we say like, okay, Paul, Apostle Paul, you tell me what the faith is all about. There actually is one sentence where he seems to get pretty close to saying, here's the most important thing. In 1 Corinthians 15, which uh, 1 Corinthians is probably the first of all the New Testament books to be actually written down. Paul says, for I delivered to you that which is uh, uh, as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, that sounds like our first list, according, in accordance with the scriptures. So that means that our second list has to be relevant. We can't just ditch the Old Testament and act like it doesn't matter because Paul himself is saying that the Old Testament does matter. Yeah, that's fine. I don't care. Um, So uh, I suspect with this many people in the room and and, and on Zoom, there there are at least a few people who kind of grew up and you heard Old Testament stories, but you never had someone attempt to say like, here's how all all those Old Testament stories actually connect in sequence and actually connect to each other. Are are you all ready? Okay. So... If we zoom way out, these are some of the big themes that you kind of see as you go through the Old Testament. We start the, the, the creation narrative in Genesis, then you get into the era of the patriarchs, Exodus, conquest, and then they get into the land, you have the judges, and then the kings of Israel, then everybody gets booted out of Israel, taken into exile, and eventually they get back, right? That's the Old Testament. That was probably too broad. So I'm going to go a little more in detail. All right, somebody with a smartphone with a timer. We're going to go fast, all right? I, I mean... I, I can't, obviously, I can't go to detail. Let's see how quickly we can summarize the Old Testament. And if you're wondering, like, how do the different stories I've heard actually connect? You ready? Go. go. All right, here we go. So, uh, oh, my apologies. The dates on here are, are like from the, the Bishop Usher, hardcore, young earth, 6,000-year-old earth. So, obviously, that's uh, somewhat controversial. So, don't pay attention to that. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are sometimes called the primeval history. This is where you get an account of creation. You hear about the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. What we call the fall is the idea that they rebelled and sinned against God, and they get booted out of, that, out of the garden. They begin to have children, Cain and Abel, Seth, etc. The earth uh, uh, gets, gets more and more populated, and you get to the story of Noah. Noah, of course, is connected with the flood, so the idea that, that there's, a, there's a flood and people die. And then uh, there's the Tower of Babel, where people are then kind of scattered across the earth, and they speak different languages. This Genesis 1-11 through 11, it will be a major focus of Ratio Christi this fall. And this tends to be one of the most controversial parts of the, of the Old Testament to, to interpret. Okay, after that you get into the era of the patriarchs. There's this guy named Abraham who lives in Ur, which is kind of like modern-day Kuwait slash Iraq. And God calls this one specific guy and says, I want you to leave where you are and go to a land I'll show you, and I will make of you a great nation. Is This is where we first hear this idea that God is calling a specific nation, which we later will call Israel. Abraham goes to this new land. He has a series of misadventures. He and his wife have no children. They have a miraculous child named Isaac. Isaac later gets married, also has trouble conceiving, but he ends up having uh, twin sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob's name is later named 
is later changed to Israel. That's where that name comes from. One of Jacob's sons, Joseph, uh, actually gets sold into slavery by his brothers, but it turns out it was God's plan anyway to get, save the family from a famine, and they all, all, the whole family goes down to Egypt where they grow from one family into an entire nation. As you may know, they then get enslaved several hundred years later by the Pharaoh, and they call on God to try to save them. God raises up this guy that you've heard of, I'm sure, named Moses. Moses, leave, the plagues happen, they leave Egypt, they go into the wilderness, and they receive what we call the Torah, the law, right? They receive this list of laws by which they as a nation are supposed to worship God, be special, be separate from all the nations around them. They eventually reach the promised land. Uh, Moses dies, a guy named Joshua uh, leads them into the promised land. There's a series of, uh, of battles and wars, and they, they, they take over the land. There's a, then a period, which we call the judges, where the people live in the land, but they don't have a king. And eventually they get tired of that. They, well, they, they, they get oppressed, and then God raises up kind of a temporary ruler called a judge who will get them out of that jam. But eventually the people demand a king. Their first king is named Saul, and the second king, well, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of, is named David. This is about as close to a golden age as you can get. If you ask the people of Israel, what, what are you after? What do you really like? I like it when we have a kingdom, we have a good king, and we're following God, because that's when times are good, right? So this is the kingdom time. Uh, David's son Solomon, you may have heard of, uh, was known for his wisdom and for building a temple. So this is also kind of good times, but it doesn't last very long. Solomon's son Rehoboam is, uh, uh, is such a, a, a fool that he ends up uh, alienating part of the country, and the country actually splits into two, with Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Israel has a series of mostly bad kings who don't follow God, and Israel actually gets oppressed and sacked and taken off by an outside kingdom of Assyria. Similar kinds of adventures in Judah. Some of Judah's kings are good, some are bad, but eventually they are also sacked by an outside uh, force, in this case Babylon, who then takes them uh, into exile. They're all exiled into Babylon and taken out of their land. So this is like the worst thing that can happen. They got up to the point, they got out of slavery, they had their own country, and now it's taken away from them again. All throughout this time are where you hear about the kings of Israel and also the prophets. The prophets are a new way of God speaking to his people, usually critiquing the people in power, usually for, uh, uh, for leading the people away from God and into some sort of idol worship. Okay, the time of the exile is when you have, that's when the stories like Daniel come along and Esther, right? The Babylonians get, kind of get taken over by the Persians, so that's where the story of Esther comes along. And eventually the people in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah are able to go back to the land of, of, Pal, of what we would now call Palestine. They're able to go back, but things aren't exactly restored. There's not a kingdom the way that David had a kingdom. The Persians, as you know, uh, uh, gave, give rise to the period of Alexander the Great. This is basically where the Protestant Old Testament ends. My apologies to my Catholic friends. Most of the, of the, the books of the Apocrypha would fall in this kind of, kind of time where um, the Greeks take over and, and basically the people, the Israelites, um, are never really in charge of their own land. And eventually the Romans take over. And that's the context where Jesus comes along. Okay, what's my time? Ah, that was longer than I wanted. Okay, whatever. But at least you see the idea. It's not a bunch of distinct stories that are disconnected from each other. It's one continuous story about this nation of Israel. And at this point, you should be somewhat frustrated because you say, why are we spending so much time about this? If you go and you read about apologetics and worldview, usually the only part of the Old Testament that, that uh, Christians like really harp on is the creation. The idea that God made the world good, then there is some kind of fall or rebellion of, of man, and we say, how do we get out of that? How is the world going to be redeemed? Creation, fall, that's Genesis, and then all the way to the New Testament in redemption. And if you think in those terms, everything makes great sense, except you say, like, why are we wasting all this time with all this drama with kings and prophets and whatnot in the history of Israel in the Old Testament? So that's what I want to get into tonight. That question has puzzled Christians for a long time. And there are a lot of kind of tempting shortcuts to get out of that particular question, Okay. So I'm going to draw a series of kind of maps of how Christians have tried to answer this question in the past. Um, by far the most common uh, throughout the centuries is for Christians to think, well, in the Old Testament, Israel's the people of God, and then now that's, that's no longer the case. Now the church is the people of God, and there's some kind of a break, and the church effectively replaces Israel. We don't have to worry about all the Israel stuff in the Old Testament because that doesn't really apply to us. We don't have to worry about those prophecies and kings and, and whatnot. This is probably, this is what your average medieval Christian probably would have thought. They didn't think about the Old Testament a lot. They probably didn't know their details very much. And they thought, well, that's Old Testament. Now the church is the people of God. Um, this should cause you some discomfort for multiple reasons. One of the biggest reasons is, um, as you may know, uh, uh, you would think with Israel being such a big part of the Bible that Christians would not have any sort of hatred 
toward people of a, uh, uh, from the, the Jewish faith or Jewish, Jewish ethnicity, but historically that actually has been true because of this idea that the church replaces Israel. It's made it a lot easier for Christians to, um, to, to show attitudes and actions that are anti-Semitic. This is especially true in the medieval church, right? And so this, if you go back and read stuff from the 1200s, 1300s, all the way through like the 1700s, you'll see this sort of language a lot. The idea that Israel is replaced and uh, they rejected Jesus. And so um, then these anti-Semitic pogroms would then happen afterward, right? Some of you may think like, wait a minute, Christians are anti-Semitic? When I think of evangelicals in the U.S., I t- tend to think of them as being like super pro-Israel. And part of the reason of that is the advent of what's been called dispensational theology. That word dispensational emphasizes the idea that God acts certain ways in different points in history, toward Israel this way, then toward the church. But dispensationalists tend to emphasize that all those promises and things to Israel, those prophecies, we can't discount them and just pretend like they don't matter. So there must be some future plan in the end times in their eschatology that applies to Israel. And so a dispensationalist will tend to emphasize there's this Israel period. Now there's a kind of a church period, but there is some Israel period in the future. And God still cares about Israel. There's still some special relationship there. This is why in the U.S., that you, again, the, the stereotype is that evangelicals tend to be very pro-Israel is because they still see that same special relationship. Um, dispensational theology has kind of been kicked into overdrive since 1948 when the modern state of Israel began to exist. But it actually was there even in the 1800s. There were meetings between D.L. Moody and some of the, 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 uh, the real early uh, Zionists who wanted to establish a, Jew, a Jewish homeland in the Middle East. So, um, in fact, this is, more, this is a lot closer to what I grew up with. And, in fact, some of the books I grew up with would literally put the church, the idea of the Christian church, in parentheses. Saying like, Israel, church, more Israel, right? And so this is very much connected to eschatology beliefs, okay? However, the most common way to look at the Old Testament, sometimes this is on purpose, sometimes this is an accident, is to view the Old Testament as a series of disconnected moral stories. Um, Now, some churches do this quite intentionally, saying like, well, Old Testament, I don't know, it's more so to teach us moral stories. But even if you or your church doesn't believe this, the way we approach the Old Testament with distinct stories about Abraham, David, Daniel, is we treat them as these little distinct stories to teach us something about how we should live and about who God is. But they're disconnected, they're not part of some connected story. So if you came through Sunday school in a church in the U.S., this is probably what you heard, more or less. An interesting perspective on this point comes from this guy. His name is Phil Vischer. Has anyone heard that name before? Okay, Phil Vischer became very famous for originating the series Veggie Tales. He is the voice of Bob the Tomato. And what is fascinating, Phil is a, a brilliant guy. Um, I would really recommend his stuff. He's great. But one of the things that Phil has said is that he felt like Veggie Tales, without him meaning to, contributed to this idea that the Old Testament is full of a bunch of disconnected moral example stories. And here in recent years, he actually produced a completely different set of videos for children called What's in the Bible. And it starts with Genesis and it goes all the way to Revelation, emphasizing the fact that these stories are all connected and all part of the same overall historical arc rather than being disconnected. This is what my children get a heavy dose of on road trips right there, I'll tell you. So um, I want to emphasize, and I actually think Phil is right, because that continuity is much closer to what the first century church believes. So I'm going to give you a different map and I know you're going to forget most of what I say tonight, but if you're going to like, just remember one slide, this is probably the one. Instead of thinking of a disconnect, I want to emphasize a few different things. I want to emphasize the idea that you have Israel, and then there is uh, Jesus is what starts all this big change. And I want to emphasize a few things. There's continuity between Israel and the church. There's expansion, and the expansion is mainly due to the fact that you've gone from one people group that are the people of God to something that goes to the Gentiles across the entire world to, a, to create a multi-ethnic church. And if you say, well, what was the point of all this? What was the point of all this history of Israel? Much of that Old Testament narrative that we don't know what to do with is all pointing ahead to Jesus. And, and, and I don't just mean prophecy. I mean the narrative itself actually all points ahead to Jesus as the focal point of the story. Um, I really like the way that the Bible Project uh, uh, describes it. They, they, they phrase it as, we believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. So emphasizing continuity rather than discontinuity, and the fact that some of the stuff in, in, in the Old Testament we're not sure what to do with, like all the different laws, a lot of that stuff is all pointing ahead to Jesus as the focal point of the story. So that's what I want to recommend to you tonight. The, uh, let's start with this first point, 
continuity. It's clear that the early church thought they were continuous rather than a break with, with uh, the Old Testament. Um, Jesus says, you search the scripture, scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. <clears throat> in Luke 24, uh, if there was any part of the Bible I think I'd like to be present for, this might be it. This is the famous walk to Emmaus, where after the resurrection, a couple of Jesus' uh, disciples are walking along, and Jesus is with them, and they, they don't know it's him. And he says, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his, glo- enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So that's where all those arrows that I had on the prior slide came from. This idea that the early church says, yes, these stories, what the prophets are talking about, everything God is doing throughout the history of Israel is one continuous story that points to Jesus. Um, Those of you who've looked through the Gospel of Matthew will note that this phrase, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, that phrase shows up a lot throughout the whole Gospel of Matthew because the author of the Gospel of Matthew is trying to emphasize that level of continuity. Furthermore, um, uh, the New Testament actually says these Old Testament saints, people like Abraham, actually are looking ahead to Jesus. That's the focal point. That's what they wanted to see. Uh, Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. And when the early church, someone like Stephen, is asked, what do you believe? He goes through the whole story of the Old Testament, just like I did a moment ago, and says that it culminates in the person of Christ. Okay? They don't emphasize discontinuity. They emphasize continuity. Furthermore, if you're going to understand the New Testament, you have to have the Old Testament story to understand what Jesus is actually trying to do. So here's one of the biggest things I've learned that I had never thought about before. Do you remember in the timeline a moment ago? You have the kingdom of Israel, and then everybody goes into exile. And so in the first century, the people that Jesus is talking to, one of the questions on their mind is, is the exile over? The exile was bad. We all got carted off to Babylon. Is the exile over? Well, we're not in Babylon anymore. We're back in the promised land. Do we have a king on the throne? Not really. Do we feel like we're in charge? Is this really what God wanted for us? Are we really fulfilling our mission? The answer kind of seems to be no. And you have different groups like the Pharisees. Some of you may have thought of the Pharisees as these self-righteous people who are trying to save themselves through their actions. What made the Pharisees act the way they did is they said, if we will all just follow Torah, then maybe the exile will be over and God will restore things. Another group you have are the zealots who say, Maybe we should have the exile be over by taking matters into our own hands and booting these God-forsaken Romans out of the country, right? So they're all asking the same question. We want the exile to be over. And Jesus comes along and says, what is your mission? What is your mission? The mission of Israel, the mission God gave to Israel, and the mission that Jesus himself accomplishes when he finally shows up is that God's kingdom would be inaugurated and this nation of Israel would be a blessing, not just to themselves, but to the, outer, to the other nations, This is what God says to Abraham. He says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So that means, even though we tend to think of the Old Testament as focused on Israel, the goal is that Israel will be a blessing to the entire world. And through Jesus, that actually comes true. I also want to talk about the idea of expansion. Um, If you say, like, what was the biggest controversy in the early church? It's almost certainly this point, that the early church is entirely made of Jews, but then they start to expand to Gentiles. They're like, what do we do with these Gentiles? And one of the things that Paul emphasizes is the thing that they didn't see coming, the thing they didn't really understand, is this mystery. And Paul says, this mystery is that now we know the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We didn't fully understand that. And so the thing that they're working through in the book of Acts and in Paul's letters is realizing, like, the gospel is for all the nations, not just for Jews, and we want the Gentiles to be a part of this multi-ethnic church. And a lot of the controversy that Paul addresses is what marks out the people of God? What marks out the church? Is it following the Torah? No, it's not following the Torah. And so we're not going to force these Gentiles to take on these Jewish characteristics. The gospel is bigger than that because so much of the Torah was pointing toward Jesus that we don't continue to follow it because it all pointed toward him. Paul says stuff like this all over the place. Look at this. The revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all the nations. So part of what is so special about that moment where Jesus comes is it not only inaugurates God's kingdom, but it expands it beyond Israel to the other nations as well. Um, Those of you who have been to Greece may have seen this spot. This is the Acropolis. Up top, you can see back here is the Parthenon. And here in the foreground is this little rocky outcropping, outcropping called the Areopagus, 
also called, called Mars Hill. Acts 17 describes Paul standing on this exact spot. And if you read Acts 17, you don't realize it, but Paul is actually pointing back at the Parthenon itself and saying, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of men. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man in whom he is appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This idea that people throughout the world were ignorant, but something has changed. Because Jesus has come, God's kingdom is inaugurated, and now this, this is the time for the gospel to go out to all the world. Okay? Um, this third part is probably going to be the hardest for us to grab a hold of, and it's the idea of narrative. Many people don't like applying the phrase narrative to the Bible, especially to the Old Testament, because there have been these fights within, among Christians, and anytime you start putting words like literary or narrative on the Old Testament, that's viewed as non-historical. So some people say, no, no, the Old Testament is historical. And other people are like, no, it's really narrative. It's trying to tell a story. What I want to tell you today is that these two are not mutually exclusive. The Old Testament can be historical that, that, and that actually and it's something that we can actually hold to, but also God be telling a narrative. The choices of what happens in the Old Testament, which stories are told, and how they're told, is intended to provide a point. And if you're wondering, like, what do we mean by narrative? If you think about the books that you love the best, a narrative tends to build up some kind of expectation or tension, right? And you're like, oh, what's going to happen? And then the tension gets resolved, but not necessarily in the way you think. It may be in a way that's beautifully unexpected. And what I want to argue is that if you look at the story of the Old Testament leading into the person of Jesus, the Old Testament builds up expectations and tensions, and those expectations and tensions are resolved in the person of Jesus in a way that nobody expected. So there are lots of examples of this, narratives all through the Old Testament. Some of the, the, the classic ones, if you look through the Old Testament, you see that there's a consistent narrative theme that God is the source of victory. In the book of Judges, God actually like reduces the Israelites' army at one point just so that they'll know that it's not their military might that saved them, but God. David says the same sort of thing. This is David speaking to Goliath. He says that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. So this is a common theme through the Old Testament, that God is going to do things the way that humans don't expect. Humans expect to win by military might. God says, reduce the size of your army, because you're going to win by my might. God loves to upend human expectations. Whatever your expectations are of, here's how I would do it if I were in charge, God does it the opposite way. He wants to build a nation, and the first person he goes to is this old childless couple, Abraham and Sarah. He goes to them specifically because they're old and childless, so that he can show that he is the one who inaugurates this nation through the miraculous birth of Isaac. Um, he wants to get a king, and he goes to this little place called Bethlehem, and uh, it's none of the older sons of this man named Jesse who get picked out as king. It's the youngest who's out in the fields watching the sheep. If any of you have ever been to my office in Jackie Brown, you've seen that I have this framed Bible verse that my wife printed on an old-timey print in Wittenberg, Germany. And it's 1 Samuel 16, 7. A man sees what is in front of him, but the Lord sees the heart. This is what God says to Samuel about David. This idea that it's not what you expect, Samuel. I see the heart, and it's going to be contrary to your expectations. And finally, this, is all, this all shows up big time when Jesus finally comes. Jesus, um, N.T. Wright describes Jesus as a double revolutionary. People are ready for the exile to be over, and Jesus shows up, and indeed, Jesus says, Caesar is not Lord. Right? That's what got the early Christians in trouble, is refusing to, to, to acknowledge that Caesar was Lord. But then, instead of a political revolution like the Jews are looking for, Jesus comes with a different kind of revolution that's not based on military might. He says, my kingdom's not of this earth, otherwise my followers would fight. So he ends up being surprising to both parties and challenging to both parties. Okay? Um, uh, I think the Bible Project does a really great job of this. If you've never seen any of their videos, I really highly recommend them. He, they they emphasize this idea of narrative. They said, we help people experience the Bible by showing the literary art of the scriptures and tracing them the themes, founding them from the beginning to end. Um, in fact, if you go to their website, one of the things they'll do is they'll take these different themes, like the temple or holiness, and trace that theme throughout the whole Bible, from the Old Testament all the way through, and show how you can tell the whole story of the Bible through that one theme. And then they do that 40 different ways. And if I had to say one of the reasons that I'm a believer, one of the reasons that I, I think that the Bible is not just true but beautiful, is because these themes can be traced throughout all of Scripture so beautifully in so many different ways. And the Bible Project does a great job of this.
I genuinely coming here tonight felt guilty. I was like, instead of hearing me, we could just watch like five or six of these, and it would be better than listening to me. But they didn't give me that option. So um, I would encourage you to check that out yourself. Um, it's really changed the way I look at the Bible, he, even here in the last four to five years. One example that I, really struck me was um, the Old Testament cleanliness laws. If any of you have ever tried to slog it through Leviticus, you're like, if you touch that, you're unclean. Don't touch that or you're unclean. Go outside the camp and show yourself to the priest. Blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of stuff, not just about keeping yourself morally pure, but keeping yourself ritually pure. You can't touch some dead thing or it makes you unclean, right? You can't touch someone with leprosy. That'll make you unclean. And so there was this constant focus in Israel on keeping yourself holy and separate and ritually clean. But then when Jesus comes, Jesus actually touches lepers. He does. And instead of the leper making Jesus unclean, Jesus touching them makes them clean and changes them. This is the idea that people are, the first century Jews see that and they say, oh my goodness, something different has happened. This is the resolution to those Old Testament laws that is shocking and surprising and beautiful for those, for those, those people who saw Jesus, Jesus in action. Um, a, a little over a year ago, I had the chance to go to Israel and uh, near the Sea of Galilee, there's a little chapel and this painting is, is huge. It's as big as this wall in this chapel uh, near the Sea of Galilee in a place called Magdala. Can y'all see what the painting is? What is it? Yeah, you can see that this is that, that woman who had, she had had some kind of issue of blood for 12 years and she reaches through and touches the hem of Jesus' garment and is healed. Same thing. By touching that woman, Jesus should be considered ceremonially unclean because she had been unclean that whole time. But instead, she is healed and it upends all of our expectations about the way Jesus relates to the law. This kind of artwork, by the way, reaches back a long way. Here's a similar image. This is from the catacombs in Rome and dates to the 4th century AD. People saw that same sort of beauty all the way back then, seeing that the way Jesus relates to people who, who were considered unclean upends our expectations. Okay? I'll give you another example. Um, some of you all may have heard of the tabernacle. In that time when the people were wandering in the wilderness before they got to the promised land, they set up this little tent called the tabernacle. And this is where they would hold these religious ceremonies. This is where the priests would go. You can see the Ark of the Covenant. It really, this is the only thing that Raiders of the Lost Ark got right. Is the Ark of the Covenant really does look correct in that movie. Everything else is off. But this was, this was, um, they treated this with a high level of holiness. You did not mess around with this whole process or you could actually die because God is holy and you have to watch yourself in the way you relate to God. What's fascinating is that when Jesus comes, in John 1.14, it says, the word became flesh, it's talking about Jesus' incarnation, and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt literally means tabernacled among us. There's this idea that Jesus himself embodies the tabernacle. It used to be the people of Israel would go to the tabernacle or go to the temple in order to be with God. There's all these barriers because God is holy, the temple is holy, and they're not. And so something changes when Jesus comes. He changes those expectations. And some of y'all remember that when Jesus dies, the, the veil in the temple, that big veil that separated the Holy of Holies from everyone else is ripped from top to bottom. Any first century Jew would recognize how much meaning there is loaded in that occurrence. Okay? And I'll, I'll end with this one. Um, many of y'all know the story of Abraham and Isaac. This is a hard story, right? So uh, Isaac is, is, of course, the, um, the child of promise. And... Uh, and so even though Abraham, you know, is a mir has this miracle baby, when Isaac is a little bit older, God actually tells him to go and sacrifice your son. And Abraham doesn't know what to do, but he obeys. He takes I Isaac to this mountain and actually ties Isaac onto this altar and is prepared to kill him, right? Um, this particular incident has caught a lot of flack from non-believers who cannot believe that this little incident is in, is in the Bible. Um, one of the most articulate and forceful non-believers in recent years is, is uh, uh, the, the British author Christopher Hitchens. And he says, I'll tell you something. If I was told to sacrifice my children to prove my devotion to God and admire the man who said, yes, I'll gut my kid to show my love of God, I'd say, no, F you. So he's ethically horrified at the story of Abraham and Isaac. Why would God tell Abraham to sacrifice his son? This is not a God worthy of worship in Hitchens' view. So we all know how the story ends is that Abraham doesn't actually sacrifice Isaac. This angel stops him. What's interesting about this story is that doesn't seem to completely let it, this doesn't, to me, completely resolve the tension. Like, God still told Abraham to do this. Is this really 
the way God is going to treat us? Is this really what God wants us to be, be willing to do? Um, there's this famous story of Martin and his wife, Katie Luther. And Martin's reading to the family at the family table. And um, so he reads this story, and his, his wife, Katie, is just like, I cannot, I, he's, she's basically like, she was very blunt, right? So she's like, I don't like this story. I can't expect God to, to, um, to expect, a, I don't understand why God would ask a father to treat his son like that. And Luther's response, and he says this is what is meant by the ram who took Isaac's place. Luther's response is, Katie, God acted like that toward his own son. So you say, the father who has to sacrifice the son, Abraham is pointing toward what God would actually do. That, that God sacrificed his own son. Isaac didn't have to die because God provided a substitute. This whole story creates tension. But then when Jesus comes and dies, it resolves the tension. You say, I see why this story is in the Old Testament. It's supposed to make me uncomfortable. I'm supposed to not like it. But it's supposed to point ahead to what God actually did for us. So instead of God being cruel, like Christopher Hitchens was talking about, it actually shows how God is loving and willing to sacrifice for us and how he is gracious toward us. And that's what the narrative is telling us. Okay, so I'll stop there. Um, I know, like, so my worry is always that, like, I say a lot of words and then people forget most of it. So a week from now, if I run into you and I say, what did we talk about? You talk about, uh, the idea was, we want to emphasize not just continuity and moral examples in the Old Testament, but rather continuity, expansion, and narrative that points to Jesus as the focus of the story. Then some of you are like, yeah, but what's, what about eschatology and what's going to happen in the future? And is Israel, like, is there going to be some future Antichrist? And what about Israel? Blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of room for disagreement. Be nice to each other where eschatology is concerned. Because seriously, like, that's the thing that, that any given theologian is the most likely, thing to, uh, most likely to be wrong about. Um, so, so be nice to each other on this. There's a lot of room for competing views on eschatology. The other thing I'll tell you, and I, I take this from my experience in Israel a year ago, um, New Testament, Old Testament relations are kind of high tension because it relates also to the way that Christianity and Judaism relate, right? We said, I said a moment ago, the people who are dismissive of the Old Testament throughout the centuries, that tended to correlate pretty heavily with anti-Semitism. So I will tell you this. This is a hard thing for me to accept, but I really think it's true. If you want to engage some kind of conversation about Christianity and Judaism and share the gospel with someone within a Judaism context, you need to know that you are not writing on a blank page. A lot of Christians have come before you and written on that page and written quite poorly. There's a lot of hurt and a lot of distrust on that particular topic. So you need to walk in ready to listen, slow, slow to speak, quick to listen, quick to show kindness and grace. Um, if, there's ever, if we're going to make any progress in conversation along those lines, it has to be the Christians who are the willing to show the most deference and the most grace uh, because a lot of the people who've come in prior centuries have really done a terrible job of it, okay? Um, I want to lead into what Ben talked about a moment ago. Um, if you say, like, what's happening in Ratio Christi over the next few weeks, uh, the, the, the discussion next week is about textual criticism and how do you look at the actual text of the Old Testament and where did it come from. And there's going to be quite a bit on Genesis 1 through 11 and primeval history. How do you understand Adam and Eve and the fall and the flood and all those sorts of things? There's going to be discussion about the Exodus how the, the historicity of the Exodus and how we should understand it. And then people are continually worried about Joshua and the conquest because a, a quick reading of the book of Joshua sounds borderline genocidal, right? The people of Israel coming in and wiping out entire people groups, men, women, and children. So this makes us really uncomfortable. So when you hear that, if you hear, oh, it's about inter historicity and interpretation and ethics, for many of you, your, your shields are going to go up and you go into apologetics mode, put on my helmet, and I'm in debate mode. Here we go. But I would encourage you, that's not really what the goal is. The goal is to, to come in to have a much more open conversation. What is the best way to understand these parts of Scripture? How would the original audience have understood these passages? What was it meant to communicate? And instead of immediately kind of going to your corners and being ready to argue, I would say it's actually better to think, what is the right way? What would honor the author of Scripture uh, would be to, to try to understand how the original audience understood it. Uh, John Walton has a great phrase. He says, the Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. What that means is anytime you come to any particular passage in Scripture, you're kind of coming as a, as a foreigner, as an outsider, 
And you need to adapt yourself to the questions that the Bible is trying to answer. That's why it would be wrong for us to go in and be like, oh, the Pharisees are so self-righteous trying to save themselves through their good works. That's not the question they were trying to answer. They're thinking about exile. They're thinking about kingdom. That's the question they were trying to answer, and Jesus gives them an answer that knocks them on their socks, right? Okay, I appreciate y'all's attention. Uh, I think now's a good time to stop and open it up for questions. I appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm, that was a good so question. The way I, I see that, that's an ongoing covenant that mm. doesn't, there's no reason to think that that's got some sort of teleological culmination anywhere. So what, mm. what kind mm -hmm. of... This is a good question. So um, different <clears throat> denominational stripes might answer this question differently. Uh, uh, what the question is referring to is, this, this, this is a super churchy word, right? Covenant. Yeah. A covenant is, is uh, uh, kind of a fancy word for a promise that has some, it's kind of binding both ways. Um, but what makes Abraham special is that God makes this covenant with him uh, uh, to, you know, as, as a promise to Abraham and to his, to his people to make a great nation out of Abraham and through Abraham's seed, through this, this nation that comes from Abraham, that all the world would be blessed. And God actually makes these covenants, additional covenants along the way. He kind of renews this covenant with Isaac and with Jacob. There's a covenant with Moses and the people. And then uh, uh, continues on that. There's actually a covenant with David. And so the idea is continually God saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. And uh, the question is, like, how do, how do we relate to that today? Um, I guess some of the denominational stripes that I, or, or, yeah, that, I, that I mentioned earlier, dispensationalists would tend to emphasize some kind of discontinuity, perhaps, between this covenant to Abraham and the covenant to the church, whereas people from more of a Reformed or Presbyterian type point of view would emphasize continuity. By the way, this is actually, this relates to even squabbles within churches about whether to baptize babies and things like that, right? So, um, but I mean, the, the truth is that it doesn't have to be a total either or. It's clearly, the, the, the New Testament refers to Abraham as kind of a, 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 um, a prototype for us. In Romans 4, it says, we are saved through faith in God. Abraham was saved through faith in God. In the book of James, James 2, it says, Abraham didn't have a dead faith that, di that didn't result in works. Abraham had a faith that resulted in works. Same thing for us. So it's interesting that both Paul and James are looking to Abraham and saying, yes, continuity with Abraham. The same kind of rules, if you want to call it that, that apply to him, apply to us today. So I would tend to emphasize continuity, which is kind of what you were getting at. I hesitate to go too far down that line because there are, whole, there are seminary students like writing their PhD thesis on this exact topic right now. Roy, go ahead. I know that, oh, I'm so sorry. The... the Organization called uh, Jews and Christians, or Christians and Jews. Jews for Jesus, yeah. And uh, they do a lot of good work, of course. But I'm, I'm very curious about how they, how they view their work. The basis for them doing something is totally different. I understand. So, uh, do you have any insight as to how they get on with each other? Yeah. So the the, the question of um, uh, the question was. Uh, uh, Messianic Jews or Jews for Jesus, uh, uh, people who claim both their, their Jewish their Jewish heritage and their and uh, uh, that they're a Christian. How do they make that work? Um, I mean, the, the the short easy answer that they would say is, all, you know, the the whole first generation of Christians are all Jewish. Paul's Jewish, Peter's Jewish, all these guys are Jewish, and so they would say we are fitting our faith together the same way that they did. They do try to keep a little closer hold on many of the Jewish traditions holding on to things like, we're going to celebrate Passover, and we're going to do all these different things, and hold on to that connection to our faith. Um, and I think that's interesting. That's, that's, that's very beautiful. Um, churches, actually, I mean, in the first century, there was quite a bit of that. One thing I will tell you that I've figured out just from reading the history is, in the first three centuries, there were a handful of occasions where Jewish Christians were told, hey, you're, you're kind of almost being, you're not making a sharp enough distinction between yourself and Jews who are not Christians, so maybe you should like leave some of their ways behind. And some of those early Christian writings along those ways were repurposed a thousand years later to justify anti-Semitism. So this question of like, how much of a break should we have is something that Christians have kind of squabbled about over the years. I, I will tell you that the hard word we heard in Israel a year ago was, um, was, was this. If, if um, today if, in, in Israel, like if, a, if a, a young Jewish man says, he goes to his parents and says, I've decided I'm an atheist. And they say, like, are you still going to, like, go to the thing and, like, Sabbath and everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still going to do all that. Like, okay. I've decided I'm a Buddhist. 
that's fine. They, they, they told me, they actually have a word for that. It's called jubus. I've never heard this. They're like, Buddhist, whatever. But the thing you can't do is become a Christian. Because, basically because of Christian mistreatment of Jews, it's viewed as um, a betrayal. Those are the people who have hated us and hurt us for a thousand years. So that's not acceptable. And that breaks my heart to hear that that's the truth. So that's a cultural barrier that's really, really hard to get past. I think there are a number of organizations, like you're saying, Roy, that would like to defuse that tension to where there can be real conversation and real continuity, but it's a pretty hard road. Zach, do we have any questions from you or from Zoom? Yeah. Uh, so first one here. Uh, do you know what's in the Bible, and is it true and reliable? Dr. Green, is your hair pliable? <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> if you don't recognize it, that's, a, that's part of the, uh, the theme song for what's in the Bible. They couldn't think of anything to rhyme with Bible, so I don't think your hair is pliable, I think is what they say. That's funny. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, this relates to a talk that I actually gave at Rosh Christie a while back on the topic of inerrancy. Um, have you all heard this word before, inerrancy? Inerrancy basically means, like, does the Bible make mistakes or not? And uh, historically, most, you know, most kind of Bible-believing Christians have said, yes, the Bible is inerrant. But then it's like, well, what does that mean? How do you know? And uh, I guess to me, I, I summarize uh, the, author the authority of the Bible on kind of two fronts. When I say the Bible is reliable, it means it's authoritative. The Bible says something, you don't like it, too bad. The Bible is an authority over you. And so you have to submit to it just as you would submit to an authority. Um, the second is that the Bible doesn't say oops. But you have to interpret it in the, correct, in, in the way that the author intended. So actually, I, have, I was semi-prepared for this question, so I actually have a backup slide. Let me give you a... Uh, oh, yeah. All right, check it out. Okay, I'm going to give you three people. We're going to take the book of Jonah, Old Testament. Okay, I'm going to give you three people. Person A says, I read the book of Jonah, and I believe it is historical. And I believe it, whale and all. Yeah? All right. Person B says, I don't think the person who wrote the book of Jonah really meant it to be taken literally. I think it's, it's much more a word picture of Liz Israel's lack of mercy toward the Assyrians and all these other countries around it. If the way you, that, I think that's what the author of the book of Jonah intended to communicate, and it's not necessarily supposed to be historical. Okay, person C. Person C says, well, maybe people back then thought you could be swallowed by a whale and survive, but we now know that that's scientifically that's impossible and that miracles don't really happen. So, I mean, we'll just kind of take it as a morality tale and try to draw lessons along from the book of Jonah. But it's not historical. Okay. Person A, does person A believe in inerrancy? Looks like it. Person C, does person C believe in inerrancy? No. Pretty doesn't lo really look like it. They're basically saying, like, ah, oh, these primitive people got something wrong. Does person B believe in inerrancy? Yeah. <laughs> kind of looks like they do because they're focused on, they're saying, here's what I think the author intended, and I believe it. Here is the problem, and the, 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 what I'm about to describe to you happens in churches every day all over the country. Person A is very suspicious of person B because person A thinks person B is just person C in disguise. Person B says, like, I don't think it's meant to be taken historically. Aha! You don't believe in inerrancy. The reality is that probably person A and person B both do believe in inerrancy, but they disagree about interpretation. But person A is being a little, a little paranoid, right? They're saying, if you don't believe in my... My interpretation is obviously right. And if you don't believe in my interpretation, it's because you believe Scripture has an error. Here's the messed up part. There have been times when person A thinks person B is actually person C in disguise and been right. That stuff has actually happened. And what I'm telling you is, as soon as these people start like being paranoid, like that, that you're not arguing in good faith, it's impossible to have a discussion. And so what I would want for Ratio Christi is to not have this, this kind of like suspicious paranoia. If, if person B gives this kind of interpretation, like take them at their word, argue with them, and try to figure out what the right interpretation is. I am in the person A category, but what I'm telling you, for most of you, you're in this category, and I'm telling you, like, be nice to these people. <laughs> because they have the same, they're trying to, to treat Scripture with the same honor that you are. They may just interpret it differently than you do.
Make sense? Okay, I hope that was helpful. I'm not joking when I say this is a big deal. Like there are entire seminaries that have been ripped apart by like exactly this. Another question, why does God command so much violence, particularly in Exodus and Joshua? Hmm, I have been pre-instructed to, so the question was why does God command so much violence, especially in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua? Um, I have been pre-instructed to say like, Coming soon, right? That's what we're supposed to talk about in the next few weeks, and so I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it or steal the thunder. Okay. So sorry. Other questions? All right, cool. I'm going to hand it off to whomever, whomever I'm supposed to hand things off to. Is that you, Ben? All right, cool. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it.